In a few moments, we are going to observe the rite of confirmation. Since September, Michael, a.k.a. Santa Claus, has been guiding three of our young people on a journey toward full membership in the church. And along the way, they have explored the questions of what it means to be a Christian. What does it mean to be a member of a church? How do we live lives of discipleship? Now, you might ask why youth need to go through confirmation. After all, aren't the youth baptized and already members of the church? Yes, in a way. However, as Presbyterians, we typically allow for the baptism of infants. Many of us, myself included, were baptized when we were just three or four or five months old. And at the time, we had no idea what was happening to us. We baptize these infants on the faith of their family. At baptism, the child is clueless as to why this, well, scary person in a black robe is very rudely pouring cold water on their head. But the church considers the faith of the home and recognize that each, that this child is being raised in the faith and therefore is suitable for baptism. So, we come here today and we offer these young people the ability to accept or confirm their baptism, to claim it as their own. It is their opportunity to stand before you and state publicly that while they did not understand what was happening in their baptism, they do now, and they want to claim it. They want to confirm that baptism. Now, invariably, when you have a group of youth going through this confirmation process, there will be one or two who are in the youth group who, for whatever reason, were not baptized as infants, and that is okay. What we do is baptize them on the day of confirmation, and which makes this day a doubly joyful occasion. It, we have confirmation and we celebrate the holy sacrament of baptism. And there is no better occasion for baptism or confirmation in the church than Easter Sunday. Historically, in the early church, it was on Easter that adult converts were baptized into the faith. In the earliest days of the church, Baptisms, it seemed, took place uh, spontaneously. In the book of Acts, we find several stories of people giving themselves to Christ and then being baptized there on the spot. For example, there's the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. And we read in Acts, as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the man said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? Well, Philip said nothing, so they went down to the water, and Philip baptized the man. However, by about 150 A.D., Christians began to generally agree that becoming a Christian was a three-part process. One, accepting Christ. Two, living a Christian life. Three, being baptized. And by this time, baptism normally took place on Easter after a period of fasting and prayer. Baptism became more intentional. And then by the third century, another couple hundred years later, this protocol had developed into a full three years of training. And the church called these converts, and these were adults, catechumens, and this time of preparation was called catechetical training. And part of the training was to memorize the catechisms. However, even before they were tasked with this job of learning the doctrines of the church, the church felt that something else was more important than that. And the church felt it was most important that they learn how to live their lives of faith. So the first thing they did was to teach 
prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Sound familiar? The commitment required to become a Christian was enormous. The people took it that importantly. In time, however, this three years of catechetical training eh, became a bit much, and so it was condensed down to fit within the 40 days of Lent. And during the season of Lent, the candidates were publicly examined. Their friends and family and neighbors were asked to testify to their character. There was also in-depth Bible training led by the bishop himself. And then the final week of Lent, Holy Week, was then devoted to prayer and fasting and reading the scriptures. And on the night before Easter, the candidates gathered together and observed the Easter vigil. And then at dawn, they went to the church for their baptism. Now, through the centuries, understandably, there were fewer and fewer adult baptisms and more infants that were being baptized. And because of this, Lent lost its significance as a time of training, but instead became a time for all in the church to prepare for Easter, as we do today. And the connection between baptism and resurrection, between baptism and new life, became increasingly difficult to envision. For example, when I stand up here with an infant for a baptism, I'm not thinking of death and rebirth. I'm thinking of birth. I'm holding a three-month hold, hold in my arms. But both baptism and Easter, they call us into new life that we profess in Jesus Christ. In the ancient church, a sign of this new, as a sign of this new life, the catechumens would remove their clothes and go naked into the waters of baptism. They were casting off their old sinful selves, and then they would put on new robes, and thus living out the words that Paul wrote to the Galatians, as many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. Their very clothes became an expression of their faith. Now our scripture reading for today from the Gospel of John tells about how on the third day following Jesus' crucifixion, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb where Jesus' body had been placed. She got there and she sees that the large stone sealing the tomb had been pushed aside. And without looking anymore, she just runs back to tell Peter that Jesus' body had been taken. And then Peter and another disciple race back to the tomb. Peter loses the race. And when they get there, they see that indeed the body is gone. But since there was nothing they could do about it, they go back to where they're staying. And a bit later, Mary returns to the tomb. She wasn't running. And not knowing what else to do, she just stood at the tomb weeping. But then finally she looks into the tomb and there she sees two beings, two angels who are sitting where Jesus had laid. And they ask, why is she crying? And she tells them that she doesn't know where the body has been taken. Mary then turns around and she sees Jesus standing behind her, but she doesn't realize that it's Jesus. She doesn't recognize him. She assumes that he's the groundskeeper, and she asks if he's responsible for the body having been moved, and if so, tell her where it is, and she will take care of it. When Mary and Peter go to the tomb that day, they do so with certain expectations. They expect to find a corpse. After all, Jesus is dead. He had been killed. His body had been placed in this tomb. And their experience matches our experience that dead things stay dead. Their expectation was that the body would be in the tomb. But then when they find the tomb empty, well, they make the logical assumption that someone has taken the body. I mean, after all, bodies don't just get up and walk away, do they? That was their expectation. 
what they didn't expect that morning, and they should have, however, was the miracle of resurrection. Mary had gone to the tomb that morning before sunrise to prepare the body for its proper burial. Because after all, this was the end. Jesus has lived. Jesus had died. It was over, wasn't it? And now they figured they would probably just go back to their old lives. But that morning, there at the tomb, he wasn't there. Far from it. And this empty tomb was not the end as they expected, but instead it marked the beginning of something greater, something which continues today. The resurrection is the fulfillment of God's promise of new life, God's promise of salvation. The resurrection is evidence that there is nothing in this world, not even death itself, that is an obstacle to God's work. God does not leave us. God does not abandon us. We are never so broken that we cannot be mended by God's love. We can be saved. So, on this Easter Sunday morning, the question that I put before you is this. As the youth are up here confirming their baptisms, do you confirm the resurrection? Do you accept what God did at a time when you did not understand it? As I said, the youth have spent the past seven months preparing for this day, and I want them to know that this is not the end of their journey. You don't join the church and then just disappear. This is only the beginning. This is the beginning of a new life in Christ. Their lives as Christians begin here. This is their standing at the tomb moment. And let us make it a stand at the tomb moment for all of us. I mean, they may expect that after the seven months of training and study, that's the end. But no, it starts now. And for those of you, those of us who were long ago baptized, I ask that as we read the baptismal vows this morning, that you listen and that you claim them as your own, that you remember what you don't remember. On this Easter Sunday, recommit yourselves to living lives in Christ as these Young people will commit their lives to Christ today. Amen.